Welcome to the Picking Nerds. Today we got 15 cards for you. 15 cards that are over performers. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, Beezy, and that makes us the nitpicking nerds. Do you like daily commander stuff? That's today, because it's every single day. If you want to support the channel, one of the best ways to do it that not many people know about, Joe, is the subscribe button. Yeah, I don't know. Some, A lot of YouTubers are sleeping on the subscribe button. We're getting on that. But if you've already done that and you want to give us some money directly, patreon.com is the best way to do that. Go the extra mile to support us. Two indirect ways. There's a TCG player link in the description below. Go there. Click the link. As long as you started with the link, you can buy all the magic cards you wanted anyway at the same price you wanted them anyway, but we will get a kickback and you'll support this channel. What's the other one, BZ? Dragonshield.com, EU, US, links in the description for you. Start those links, buy stuff, and then when you check out, we get a kickback on the order. And today is a day of the year, so happy birthday to everyone whose birthday is today. Yes, happy birthday, everyone. And everyone over the weekend who we missed. Because I'm going to start doing that on Mondays because everyone feels so bad when we miss somebody. So happy birthday to everyone for today, Saturday, and Sunday. So let's get into this video. Over performers. These are cards that we've tried in decks. And then we went, oh, these are better than we thought they were. Now some of the cards you might go, I already knew that card was good. Well, obviously this is coming from our perspective. It starts with us not thinking the card is either is just okay or just good. Or maybe we don't think it's good at all. And now we think, well, this card, every time I draw it, has been awesome. Yeah, and it's not like, oh, you know, we thought these cards were terrible. Yeah. Most of the time, it's we thought these cards just, like, weren't playable. And then we are playing them at our, like, medium power level. And, oh, we thought they were bad at that power level, but they're actually okay. Yes. So we're going to hop right in. The first one is a Chroma's Will, a card I put in the deck when I first when I first was spoiled. And I think we even had it graded pretty highly. Uh, yeah, I think we gave it like a B or something. Yeah, when we first talked about it. But then I kind of went down and I'm like, oh, this card's not performing well. And now, lately, it's just been an awesome finisher. BZ literally, he 40'd me yesterday just out of the blue with this card and I couldn't block anything. I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, if combat matters for you, this is like one of the best ways to go. It literally just skips combat and it just says, produce 20 power, kill someone. Yes, and it's really simple to do. It's not that hard to put 20 power on the board. And usually, players are going to chump. They're going to just block or, you know, stop some of the damage. They're not going to with the Chroma's Will. It's got protection from all colors. And if that wasn't enough, because their colorless creature can block, it has flying. So the only way they're blocking is with a colorless flying creature like Joyro's Familiar. Yeah, it's just not happening. And this is such an easy way to close out games, even more so than we thought reading it, giving a thousand keywords. And when you kill somebody, well, you're now at, like, 70 life. So good luck to everybody else trying to finish you off and your guys have vigilance. Yes. So next is Authority of the Councils. This one is one mana and whenever a creature an opponent controls enters the battlefield, enters tapped and you gain one life. This gains so much life. It's so annoying. I just, you're going to play this almost at any point in the game and it's going to be worth like 20 life. It's almost a card that is like just good enough that no one's going to kill like every single time, no matter what's happening. And you're going to gain a bunch of life, and it slows down decks because they're not going to be able to block for a whole turn, which is kind of valuable in combat metas. And they're not going to be able to use haste or attack you because everything's tapped. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the card is super, super annoying. I mean, blind obedience we already knew was good. This yeah. is like a, this is along those lines. The annoying tap thing is just it's actually very frustrating and annoying when you can't again can't block for a whole turn, and any haste effects you have are just shut off. Makes you want to try, like, Thalia, Heretic Cathar. Maybe that'll be something. Yeah, that's possible, too. What's what, What's the third one, BZ? The third one is True Conviction, a card I just kind of threw in on a whim. We put it in the Commander Cube, and it's always great there. This is a little bit higher power we're playing now than the Commander Cube. Turns out this card's just still pretty great. It's like a weird Acroma as well that just sticks around. Honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, Double Strike Lifelink, those are some of the big ones. As long as you have creatures that are bigger than, like, 1-1s and 2-2s, this is going to be... Insane. It's going to smash people into the Stone Age. Okay. Um, something super... And then This is becoming more and more prevalent as we play. And we're going to go over this on Friday. We're going to talk I can't about wait our for power that level. We're, yeah, it's going to be a good video. We're going to talk about our, our new power level. Enchantment is the most sticky type ever. It just stays. It just... You, everybody... I know a lot of things remove them. It's in green and white. Three other colors in Magic, there's two good answers at all. Yeah, there's that, like 
seven answers that aren't green and white. Yeah, blue can bounce it, but that's not a good answer. That's the crappy answer. Not permanent. That's not a permanent answer. Black can hit you with um, uh, feed the swarm, and red can hit you with a chaos warp. And then there's nothing in three out of the five colors in magic. That is crazy. I'm just learning, and we're just seeing that enchantments, they're just, I, and I like the term, stickier than you think they are. This is one of them. BZ's not only played it like on the board and it's been good right away, it's stuck around for two or three turns because it's stupid enchantment. <laughs> Stays around. <laughs> it's easier to wipe the board, but then I still have a double strike life link on the new guys. Yeah. All right, this one's this one's for you, I think. Brazen Absolutely. Borrower, Petty Theft? What's going on? I've just been a huge fan of the card. Um, it, the bounce effect is a lot better than I always expect it to be. Um, it's it's the mana advances that you get to get out of this. Will you bounce? Like, if I get to bounce something like True Conviction, like, for example, it feels really good to force you to replay. It's like you having to spend six mana, it gets bounced, and then play it again. Um, I just, the 3-1, You I think as soon as you care about the 3-1. The flyer, like evasion? The, the evasion flyer, you can do anything with this. If it's, if it's important or works for your deck in some way, get this in your deck. I think the Petty Theft is... So it's always surprisingly strong to me. This card isn't broken. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm saying Brazen Barrow goes in every blue deck. Brazen Barrow goes in any blue deck that cares about a 3-1 flyer in some way. Yeah, we kind of thought this was just not on our radar for the format. We just weren't playing this card. But it's it's actually okay. It's And I also like it. We just talked about, hey, blue can't answer certain types. Like, well, this is a two-mana way to interact with them a little bit. At least a little bit. I mean, it is annoying that you can't really get rid of it for good. But... Yeah, uh, you can combine this with a counter spell to make a two card answer. Yeah, uh, that is something I've done before, where you go bounce it. Okay, on the way back down, I'm gonna counter it. It's a thing. Number five is Kappa Cannoneer. We just talked about it as a card we got wrong, but we're reiterating it. It's an it's an overperformer for sure. Does not cost six mana. Basically, does not have Ward Four. It's really close to hexproof, honestly, on this thing. And then the fact that it just makes itself unblockable for no mana, like you don't have to invest nothing, just play artifacts, play the play the game. This thing's going to smash for like 8, and then it's going to smash for like 12, and then it's going to kill somebody unless they figure out a way to deal with it. Yeah, Kappa Cannoneer is, like you said, is a card that we admitted to getting wrong. We gave this way too low of a grade. It's just a good beater in your artifacts deck, and I think it's it's everything on this card. It it all adds up to a good card because Ward 4 is okay, whatever. It, I mean, it's not bad. It's okay. Then there's like, you know, the ability where it's unblockable gets counters. That's okay. But on top of that, it's a six mana thing. So I was like, oh, it's too expensive. Improvise. All right. Well, now we're getting it out for less than the six mana. It just, it all adds up to little, tiny, small, like, bits of good into a great card. Yeah. I, I, we had it at like a, I don't know, we were going to give this like an F or a D. And I think it's really close to like a C plus or maybe even a B minus, depending on where you're at. Yeah. I think it's still, I, I would say C, C plus. I right. think it's still in the middle range where it's like, if as you move up in power level and you're avoiding combat, obviously this, this doesn't do anything. This gets out of there really quickly. But in your combat metas, it's absolutely, it's stellar. I mean, again, um, one of the toughest things in combat metas is clogged boards. Right. Uh, they get clogged really easily because everyone's trying to do combat. Everyone's got creatures on board. But things like Kappa Cannoneer, just not being able to be blocked, that you push through damage. A lot of these are actually, a lot of the cards on this list are just going to smash through clog boards or, or push you ahead. Yes. Uh, number, I, I don't know why we're numbering them. We num six. If we randomly number these, and sometimes we don't, but this is number six. It's Morbid Opportunist. It's a 1-3 for two and a black, and whenever a creature dies, draw a card, but you can only trigger this ability once per turn. This card just kind of plays really well when you have a lot of removal. I've seen it be insanely strong on a board um, in a Zagreus deck where it was all pingers and you can just kill right. things at will. This card is... The thing that is unique about this card compared to the other options, we have your Grim Horror Specs and your Dark Prophecies Midnight and Reaper. your Midnight Reapers. Those cards are all good, but they all draw for your creatures dying. This is the only version that lets you kill something on someone else's side and get something out of it. You can just... You can set up a lot of really strong things. I think if you can... Mono black deck combined with like a uh, grave pact, you can just make this into draw at will, and that's what makes this card so strong. Is that it's not about your creatures dying, it's about theirs. Yeah, this is a role player. I think if you're playing like an aristocrats deck, you just don't even care about this. You got grim horror specs, Agreed. dark prophecy, midnight reaper, uh, yog moth, eighty five things. But if you're trying to interact and kill things and sort of play to the board, this is going to actually kind of just oh slowly add up to more and more cards. If you have a way to make someone sacrifice a creature every turn. 
maybe this is going to be way better than some of the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, it depends. We, we were laughing because, uh, I mean, this will come up later. We think Shieldred stinks. Oh, God. But the, not in this video. It won't come up in this video. We think Shieldred stinks. But uh, the ultimate combo with Shieldred is Morbid Opportunist. Right. If you build a Shieldred deck, the first card you should put in is Morbid Opportunist. It's so perfect for the deck. Yeah, if you decide that's what you want to be doing, can't argue with you. <laughs> Let's go to Cabal Stronghold. It's basically a black card, right? Joe Cherries was pretty low on this, and I was like, eh, I don't like these cards. But they are actually good, and I think this one is, I don't know, what would you say this relates to Cabal Coffers? Um, uh, how, I, how close? So it's the thing is, it is it is worse than Cabal Coffers. Yeah, there's overall. positives and negatives. Though. There's positives and negatives, as you, say, as you say. It just does tap for mana no matter what, so you're going to get a colorless mana until it starts producing. But in order for this to go positive, you need to have five swamps in play. That's a long time to wait. That's six lands in play. Basic swamps, too. So you can't mm. control Z and like retroactively make everything a swamp. Exactly. So there is the downside to this card. But as the game scales, as the game gets longer, I think this what's important about this card is a slower meta. You cannot be playing in something where people are going to be comboing because this is worthless. It's just a colorless land that will never, ever tap for your black mana. But... We're playing in a slower meta now, and something about this meta that I love is sometimes the games just grind out. It's like a lot of my decks are really good at grinding to the late game. It's like, all right, now I have Kapal Stronghold on the field. It's like, it's tapped for 11 mana. Like, it's turning 4 mana into 11 mana because it got to the late game. It's a low opportunity cost. No I mean, it's opportunity. Land. It's no opportunity cost because I literally just, I played, I was already going to play 20 swamps, whatever, 25 swamps in my deck for Kapal Coffers. Well, might as well throw in Kapal Stronghold as well. Yeah, that's why I don't I don't think these cards are the best design in the entire world, but they're still going to do things in Commander. So uh, I want to say one thing about these kind of designs. Though they, they seem like they're not the best designs, I think that they push black decks to do something that other decks don't do, and that's not maximizing utility lands. Um, right. I mean, it's just like parasitic. And also kind of not super in their wheelhouse, like Black's wheelhouse. Um, I mean, Black does care about... Black doing stuff with swamps is seems to be... It's a thing. Doubling I just, swamps. I guess I don't think it's a good design to be parasitic in like any way. No, that's completely fair. It's like energy counters. You know, if there's one good energy card in Commander, I would say it's probably a bad design. Yeah. What's next? Next is a card we reviewed in Modern Horizons 2, and we kind of were just like, hey, you know, uh, this makes a Thopter token. If you care about that, maybe like two decks in the world play this. Let's move on to something interesting. It's Brea's Apprentice. It's two in a red, you get a Thopter token, and then you can sack an artifact to either Impulse Draw or just give a creature plus two, plus zero. Oh. Turns out this little dude does enough things that it's like a C or a C plus and not like an F, like we were dismissing we it gave, as. We gave it a D plus. Like we graded that D plus and said this is okay. It does give it gives you two bodies, it allows you to impulse draw. The main thing is the two bodies. If you care about two artifact bodies for three mana, then this is kind of a card for your deck. I also like that I can turn just crappy artifacts like a treasure or any other token that you might have laying around into some advantage. It just sticks around, and it's got the good wording on the impulse draw, so you can just leave it untapped all the time, and then if it was going to die or there's a board wipe, all right, sack one of my things, impulse draw for next turn until my end of my next turn. Yeah, it, it is worded in the absolute best way. This card isn't broken. It's not busted. It's not a card that you're throwing in every deck. You have to want... An artifact creature and an artifact creature. But it's not terrible. It's not te it is not terrible anyway, and it plays better than what we originally thought, which was this doesn't play well at all. All right, up next is Nessian Wanderer, a card that when I saw it in Theros Beyond Death, I went, this is Limited. nothing. This is nothing. I would, like, literally, this is nothing is a card I would never, ever touch in Commander. Just avoid it. Um, but it's actually kind of good, and one of the reasons is we've discovered that in your... Enchantress decks, you're going to be, you have high card velocity. Cards are moving a lot. So adding this to the repertoire of your Enchantresses, now when an enchantment enters, you look at the top three and you find a land. We've been putting in burgeoning. Oh, yeah. Exploration. And, other, and all these extra land drop cards to allow us to just take advantage of cards like this. Because you're already doing high card velocity. Just hit a land. Look for a land. Make sure you're hitting land drops in your Enchantress deck. That's one of the most important things. You you got the cards. Okay, the cards are flowing. That's not a problem. But we can't play them as fast as we want. This is one of the best ways to do it, paired with all of the explorations and stuff, which I think are at this point like a must-have in Enchantress decks just because of how insane they are. Burgeoning, too. This card should just be looked at, I think, as one of the better Enchantresses on par with not better than like the Argothians and the Verdurans. But it's like it's up there, and I'm playing it in my decks, and I'm 
Really happy about it. This it's, card's great. It's a two mana enchantress. That's what's key. If this character costs three mana, it's awful. Well, um, that's worse. I, I don't think it's much different. I'm, I'm probably not touching it too often, but at two at two mana is where I'm super interested in this card because one for, again we've talked about it a million times. One mana added to a card is an insane, insane difference. And this just lets you play way more two mana enchantresses. It's true. Gives you a nice thing to do on two. Up next is just a card that everyone I think knows is good, but it never ceases to amaze me. It's greater good. This card is stupid. This I don't even understand what this card is doing. It's just so good. It is a four mana enchantment. Sacrifice a creature, draw cards equal to its power, then discard three. This card is bonkers. It's, it's like so upside and then upside and then some more, more upside on top for your trouble. It's just an absolutely insane card. If you just turn your big creatures into card draw, and if you're in a graveyard deck, now the discarding is not even a downside. You're just throwing stuff in your graveyard to reanimate later. Ah, oh, this card is just, it's stupidly good. Yeah, it's just one of the better sack outlets, period. Even in a deck that doesn't care too much about part of the card, if you're just playing big dudes, play greater good. Like, trust me, if you're playing like Momentous Fall, you can just one for one that bad boy out with greater good, and you're going to be so much happier. Yeah, I mean, you, it's just repeatable. The fact that you get to keep doing it. It's like Momentous Fall is a one-time greater good. No, no thank you. Uh, and you also, you don't need 14 cards. I promise. You can you can handle draw 14, discard 3. You will be able to do that. You should, And you should be equally as fine. I mean, it'd be weird if you weren't because... What's the... You, di like, there's well, no difference if, there. If you draw 14, you're going to discard, right? Unless you have... Pre presumably. Unless you have a Reliquary Tower, but... That's not. That's most likely not the case. How many green decks have Reliquary Tower in them? Um, for me, zero. Literally zero. For me, also zero. This, this card's amazing. Everyone knows it's amazing, but we're bumping it up even a little bit. It's just like overperforms every time. I mean, I was playing. I just play crappy cards with this sometimes, and it does work. It, it, yeah, the card just it does so much work. Anything with four power is going to be card advantage. It also lets you. Um, play around board wipe so you wait for a board wipe uh, like you have a great board and then you can just start sacking your creatures off to get some card advantage and every 3-3 three, three is just I don't even know it's like a cathartic reunion on all your 3-3s three, just yeah. for, for free yeah it's, it's, you're, you're not down any cards you just get selection yes it's weird it's a looting effect in green How? you know the classic looting effect in green yeah that is quite strange um, up next is one I've been literally nothing but impressed by and it just comes to speak to the ability of reducing cost uh, Gore Claw Terror of Calcisma, four mana, four three. When it it's, when it attacks um, creatures with power four or greater, get trample and plus, plus, one, plus one plus one. Not that's not what we're here for. We're here for the other ability. Creatures with power four or greater are reduced by two. That's a lot, and I mean a lot of reduction. You could play this card right now against me, and I would still go, eh. Let me just develop my own board, and then I'd regret it five turns from now. And I never don't do that. And it's probably because this card's in the exact same category as, like, Authority of the Consoles. It's like, eh, I can just advance my gameplay or advance my board state instead of dealing with that right now. And then it just beats you silently, and you're like, crap. Yeah. Every time. Every single time. The card is very, very good. Like I said, I think the reduction is everything on this card. That's what takes this card to being something good. We, we've we talked about in other episodes how reducing artifact costs, reducing instant sorceries is just this great ability. Well, reducing your creatures also just another great ability. Reducing your green spells in the mono green deck. The uh, medallions. The medallions. And I, we talked about uh, Goblin Narcomancer. It just turns out these kind of effects are all good. It's all about what the balance of your deck is. You obviously need to have a high concentration of creatures with power four or greater. Commander, maybe? Yeah, the, a commander with a power four or greater. All that. And then this card is just amazing. And it overperforms. And on top of all that, you get all that reduction. You it lets you just slam threat after threat after threat. It gives all those threats trample. Sprinkle in a little trample. Just for you. to go with it. And trample is a great ability to put on top of all this reduction. It's so weird. There's just this class of cards that you just whenever you see it, you know it's bad, but you still want to or have to just do your own thing and develop your own board instead of kill it. Yeah. I don't know what there's like a special class. Throw Camball into that, too, and it's just, they're all annoying. Yeah, it, I mean, the thing is, you can't afford to answer everything in Commander. Mm -hmm. That's just the You'll way... You'll lose every game. You'll lose every game if you just try and answer every single threat that comes down in Commander. So you have to prioritize which ones you're going to kill and which ones you're going to allow to stay around. And like you said, Goreclaw just falls into that with, like, Authority of the Councils. Oh, added bonus for that Nessian Wanderer we just mentioned. No one's ever going to kill that card mm -hmm. until they realize what it is. You got, like... 
I swear, if you put that card in your deck, you got five free games with it where you just get to go off. Yeah, no one's killing that card. Um, what's next? All right, this is uh, maybe almost even asterisk. This card is like low power. You know, it's not it's not busted. It's not competitive. But if you cast Apex Devastator. People need to watch out. Like, if you are able to cast that card, it's going to mess people up. Yeah, um, and this is not a card that's like, it's not a bad card by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously, it reads really well. It's a 10 mana 10 10. I think it plays better than it reads. It doesn't read very well. I, see, no, I, I think it, it obviously reads very well. I, I just see like a big vanilla, and I'm like, all right, well, maybe I'll hit something. Well, but the, usually, when it's in the right deck, that's when you go, oh, that? Oh. Oh, haste enabler, uh, and then, you know, some stuff happens. Yeah, um, so Apex Devastator reads really well. Like I said, I think people like this card a lot, and they're going, oh, yeah, I want to just slam this in every deck. It's it, We just kind of were medium on it. It's like, this card is medium. And I think it is still, I think a lot of people do overrate it still, but it definitely is outperformed in all the cases we've seen it. It's just four free spells is a lot, and it is going to be, something very strong almost every time. You're not going to whiff four times. You're not going to whiff four times. You can whiff one or two times. In, in a, lot, a lot of the decks, I think Gore Claw goes well with this card because then it's like, oh, eight mana, that's way different. That's like a lot different of a card. You want to slam all your great hinges and your card draw that cares about power and haste enablers if you're in red. And then this thing just gets pushed over the top where you've got, you've got the high curve, but you can support it because that's your deck, not just slamming this in for fun or because it's a Hydra. Once you meet the the... Let's build a deck to cast high high mana cards. This is gonna slam people. Yeah, even, even from an empty board. Absolutely. And Apex, it's so it's such a weird card because I don't want to just uh, like overhype it like a lot of people have and be like, this is the greatest card ever. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's -uh. it's but it is really good and it does perform really well in the right decks. It, it's played. I have had it in decks before and I've absolutely loved playing it. Right. We're always happy with it. It's over over performer. All right, last of the green cards, we have Nissa, Voice of Zendikar. One green, green. She pluses to make a plant. Minus is to put a plus and plus card on your old team. And she has an ultimate that we don't care about. It counts your lands and draws two cards. We're never getting there. You're really never, ever getting there with this card. It just, this card is good. Um, for it, a Planeswalker? For a Planeswalker, which is the worst type in Commander. It is three mana. That's the key. And the minus is slightly overcosted. Well, uh, it's hard to. That's the thing about the minus. It's hard to actually do that. Put a counter on all your creatures reliably, you know, every time with a magic card. There's not a lot that does it, and I feel good about playing. So, this is one of the ones that just kind of ends up making the cut as one green, green sorcery, do this, modify all my dudes, or give all my dudes whatever ability I'm trying to grant them. I mean, the key to this card is always only play it in counter decks. So, you put it in your counters decks where you have hardened skills, branching evolution. All the versions of that card where you can just, when you put one counter on, put some extra counters on. Now her minus is not just put one counter on, it's put two, and that's really, really worth three mana. And if you have a strong board, you can protect this and she can start making plants. And her, I've seen her ult threatened before. It's not like it's great and you're not aiming for it all the time. I think it really only comes up with Evolution Sage, but that's real. Yeah, it is. Evolution I mean, Sage is amazing. Yeah, it's a real thing that just can happen. And if you do ultimate it, she will get you some nice card advantage for sure. The, if you care about the minus and you can use it reliably, you're in. That's where you're going with this card. Obviously, you're not throwing this in any deck. This is this is a synergy piece all the way. But in the decks that play it, it's it's when it's combined with the hardened skills effects, and those are everywhere in your counters decks. You just go minus put two plus one counters guys on five different creatures, like. For three mana, that's really good. Yeah, we've always kind of played Nissa, or she's been on the fringe. I'd say there's a big difference between this and our cards we were wrong about series, because we weren't wrong about any of these. We're playing them because we think they're good and they're playable. And what is we're noticing is every single time, they just sort of outperform what I would expect this card to do, or what I, even what it's done before. Just like, these cards, they just do work. Even though they look good, they just do more work than that. Yes. Uh, what's next? What Give us the number 14. It's basically my invitational card, because I'll play this in any deck. Just give me an excuse. It's Idol of Oblivion. Two mana for an artifact. Taps a draw card if you made a token this turn. And sometimes you're going to pay eight mana and sacrifice it and make a 10-10. Probably not very often. You need to be making tokens really reliably. Like, your commander has to make tokens, or you're in, like, green-white tokens. You're never going to have a problem with this. Once you do that, this card is amazing. I think this card's awesome. It's a threat, like, every single time. It overperforms to the point that, like, people used to hate on me a little for playing this card all the time, and now they're like, oh, man, we got to kill that. It's all about consistency. Um, it's, if you can produce the token, 
this card is going to be awesome. And it doesn't, it looks on paper like a bad, like, Phyrexian Arena effect. Like, it's like drawing once per turn for a whole card is okay. But we've talked about this in the past. This ability, having haste and drawing the first turn it's out, is so much better than an effect that you have to wait a whole turn around the table to get your first card. Yeah, it's cheaper than Phyrexian Arena. It triggers immediately so that a turn after you play this, you're up a card, not even on cards. There's no potential for a blowout where you're not up a card. You just play this when you can, activate it, draw a card, feel good about yourself. That's almost kind of where you're at. Like, oh, hey, it's cycled, you know? If I don't make a token for the rest of the game, I'm not losing one percentage from this card. I'm back to where I was card-wise. I think this this thing overperforms every single time. Get it in your token decks, please. Exactly, yeah. And consistency, just as soon as you... If you think, hey, I can make a token most turns of the game... Then you're in. You're in for this card, baby. I think people leave this in play too much. Maybe that's why it's overperforming, or it just people can't find a spot to kill it. I mean, it's because it looks like oh, he has to make a token. Well, we mentioned a lot. We mentioned a lot. Of the, we mentioned it earlier already. Where there's just this classic card, you can't answer everything, and this kind of just sits there sometimes if you don't have the right answer. And I'll draw five cards off it. All right, last one, BZ. This one's you. Oh yeah, I uh, so I threw this card in just on a whim, like I wasn't even thinking of playing it as a good card. But calling ritual, kind of just is great every time, even in non-competitive. You know, I was like, all right, this is a CDH card where you're killing mana vaults and mana dorks with it. And there's like none of that in our meta. This card just kills five things, makes five mana, so it costs negative one mana, and then you just develop your board and do more things. I'm happy with it every time. It's really weird. I, like, I'm still surprised that this card is overperforming. Yeah, um, it makes a lot of mana sometimes, and it gets rid of all the treasure tokens. It gets rid of any token, basically. I mean, not yeah, tokens are gone. Tokens are just going to get wiped. And the fact that um, there is a lot of token decks out there, and there's just so much stuff. There's two mana and under. You want I don't, when you build decks, you should have a bunch of stuff that you can play on turns one and two. Well, guess what? It's all going to be gone oh, due to no. the ritual. This is the anti. This is the tech. For all the cards in the class you can't get rid of. It kills Authority of the Consoles. It kills, like, Meat Hook Massacre, Idol of Oblivion, Nasty and Wander, Like, all that crap that just sits in play and comes out early. You're like, when am I going to find the time to kill that? Well, if you play Culling Ritual, it just goes away. And you can answer some of the smaller stuff. Develop your mana. Slam a bigger thing. So, yeah, exactly. One of the things about the Culling Ritual is it, it, the card that we're describing, because we haven't even mentioned the mana yet, sucks. Uh, getting all that mana is what makes this card so good. It's Not only do you wipe that stuff, like, that'd be okay. You know, uh, yeah, Just play a board wipe at that it'd point. Be a, it'd be like a bad board wipe. But it refines you every bit of mana and then some. And sometimes it makes, like, 12, 13 mana because you wipe so many tokens away. I think this card does read worse than it plays, too, because it looks like it's a four mana thing that doesn't, like, four mana... To not wipe the whole board, why would I not just play four mana to wipe the board? But it's bare minimum three mana to destroy one thing, right? And you're gonna not cast it with no with nothing in play to destroy. And it plays way better than this thing just does work every time. And it's one of my go-tos for green black. I mean, I like Wing Grace of Judgment a lot. I like this a lot too. Just for removal. I good good tools to have in your toolkit. Yes. But uh, that is the video. Special shouts to every single one of our patrons. Love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable. Thank you all for the support. We seriously appreciate that you give us support. 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 You can also support us with the TCG Player by going to the link in the description, buying whatever you were going to buy anyway, checking out, and all you got to do is do that, and then we get some money from TCG Player because you used our affiliate link. Same card, same price, same place. Uh, same nerds. Same nit nitpicky nerds. You can also go to dragonshield.com. There's an EU and a US link in the description below. Click the appropriate one. You'll get sent over to dragonshield.com. You can buy the best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. And then, you know, they're sent to your house and you literally are protecting your awesome cards without having to spend any extra money again. Wow. Do we have a tidbit about our lives at the uh, end of the video? Well, we actually have to do shout outs, BC. First shout out, we got our boy, Billy Lloyd. Two L's, classic. Lloyd is a weird name. And I debated doing this one first, but we ended up doing it second because second is the best. Storm Burke, thanks for supporting the channel. Yes. Uh, next is, mine's with Storm Burke. It's Jeremy Works. Jeremy Works. AP rhymes with nothing that we're going to talk about today, but we still love you. I don't even know what you were going to, I don't even know what you're inferring. We Also, Pole Price. Uh, I it's P O U L Powell or Pole Powell I don't know I don't I'm know. terrible with names but Pole Powell Price yeah Sean Lavorse we would be remiss if we didn't mention you for supporting the channel 
Uh, I, I, that was not so weird to me. There's also the great bears of Gallowswood. Thank you, uh, all the bears of Gallowswood. That sounds like a point. legendary card from like antiquities or something. But it's not even one bear. It's multiple bears. No, the card would be an enchantment. Oh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, what was I thinking? From from Legends or one of those, they wouldn't even try. Kanan Paul. Do you rock? Yes. I, uh, I think they do. Oh, okay. Uh, wraith. Just a, this is a, just a generic like the, wraith. The mythical wraith creature? Like, yeah, it's just a generic wraith. Thank from, you. From mythology? Thank you, generic wraith from mythology. Appreciate that. And Mebo Cosmic. Is that like Mebo, like the Amiibos? Uh, from I, Nintendo? Uh, I don't know. It, it is M I I. So it, was was that the like biggest flop in the world? Amiibos? Yeah, yeah. They were trying to capitalize on the popularity of Skylanders. It was like a Skylander thing, right? No, it, I mean it was just like they were copying them. Imagine Skylanders disrupting the market. Okay, tip it about our lives. Uh don't really have anything. You got anything? Skylanders disrupted the market. Uh, Did you know? And I just that I mean to me. When that came out, I was like, this is the stupidest money sink black hole scam I've ever seen. It was monetizing. Um, it, it was DLC, but you had to buy a physical thing to get the Every DLC. Every time. Every time. It was so stupid. It's like we could release 10 characters for $5, or we could release 10 characters for $5 each. Yeah, exactly. And they were stupid figures that nobody wanted or cared about. Well, kids wanted them. But every parent was probably like, Physically, like the soul was leaving their body as they had to buy one of these. Yeah, I mean, I never got into Skylanders. I mean, I played. Clearly, we never got into it. I mean, I played. I played uh, Spyro as a kid. A I lot played of, one Spyro game. And I, play, I was like, "This is okay." I played through the first three, like on the original PlayStation, PlayStation Two. I, maybe that was my problem. I played one of the like Game Boy versions. Oh well, that's all. Probably wasn't as good. Yeah, the first three were really good and they were fun. Uh, and they've been remastered since, I believe. I'm, everything's been remastered these days. That's true. It's, I, I believe it's Reignited Trilogy. Oh, you know what? Maybe in 30 years we'll get remastered. Ooh, the Nitpicky Nerds remastered? Stay tuned. Sexier versions of the nerds? Now, can your, can your eyes even handle Not that? Not possible. Peace out, Tribe Scouts.